Good morning, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. Um, so we're going to do a few different things today. Um, but before we kind of dive into any content, just wanted to check in and see if anyone has any questions about anything right now. Morning. Not at the moment. Okay. Um, so I am going to share my screen with you for just a few minutes. We're going to do just a really quick review of a little bit of the content um, from the chapter that you read for today. Um, but just a really brief review of that. And then what I'd like to do is have us watch a few different supervision scenarios and just kind of talk through those together. Um, and just one other quick update I wanted to provide you all as well. Um, I know you have sort of an end of semester project that you'll complete with a partner. Um, now that our course um, composition is finalized and ad drop is over, um, we will begin talking about that project next week. Um, so um, we'll have the opportunity, those of you that attend live, you're welcome to work together. Um, and I'll give you part of next week's class to kind of begin brainstorming about that assignment. So if you know someone in class that attends live, you're welcome to pair up um, or else I'm happy to assign partners as well. Most of the work for the supervision role play assignment will be completed outside of class, but I will give you some time. This meeting is being recorded. All right, so this is just really a few slides, so not a whole lot here. These are posted in Brightspace, but just a little bit of a quick review of some of the key concepts from your reading for this week about the roles and responsibilities of supervisors. And I think a lot of what was contained in this chapter came up as you all um, kind of brainstormed um, your definitions of supervision and what good supervision looks like. So just a quick differentiation here of roles versus responsibilities. So roles are the functional relationships between the supervisor and supervisee. And then the responsibilities are the actual duties that the supervisor has and carries out. So they're clinical, ethical, and legal duties as a supervisor. Different professional organizations in the field are going to provide slightly different guidance um, about what these requirements are. So we already discussed that the role of a supervisor is different from the role of a clinician. We know that a supervisor has a lot of different functions that they have to serve and oftentimes these things are happening simultaneously. So here are just a few, and I think a lot of these things came up in the definitions that you all created, but teacher, consultant, mentor, advisor, sounding board, evaluator, administrator, empower, advocate, and recorder or documenter. So if you were doing all those things at once, that's certainly a lot. So what are some of these responsibilities that the supervisor has? We know that they have legal and ethical obligations, primarily to the client, but also to the supervisee. They should have knowledge of every case or client that they are supervising. They should be providing feedback and evaluation on performance to the supervisee. And it shouldn't just be something that's happening once or twice a year. This should be ongoing feedback um, to a supervisee. They should be monitoring the decisions that their supervisee is making with clients. So maybe that comes about at diagnosis, their treatment decisions, understanding if a client is progressing. And they should also be documenting their supervision sessions. So they should track any client issues that come up um, and where they've asked the clinician to follow up. Ethically, this is important because it helps to ensure good quality care. Legally, there may be federal law that requires that they document supervision. And then just in terms of risk management, if someone were to be sued and you have supervisees, that's going to come under your license, the licensed professional. So this is a good standard of care to keep this documentation and records. 
And also just to keep on top of things, to know that when you meet the next week, you can kind of pick right back up where you left off and check in with the supervisee. Also, supervision should only, of course, be occurring within your scope of expertise. You shouldn't be providing supervision um, to cases that maybe you don't see that type of therapy or that developmental level um, or something of that nature. And you should also provide supervisees with due process information. And what your text means by this is clear expectations for their performance. What is it that you are looking for in that supervisee? Providing them with procedures for handling when things maybe are not going well, which can happen. If there were disciplinary actions, how that's handled, and also the right to appeal if there were disciplinary actions. If you work within a graduate program, these may be things that are already prescribed, but if you work within an agency, having these procedures clear and outlined is important. And these are things that should be outlined at the beginning of the supervisory relationship. So really understanding what the expectations are and if they're not met, what the consequences will be. A lot of times this is done through a written contract. And this written contract can outline the scope and expectations for supervision. Oftentimes I'll have my supervisees have a first attempt at that on their own and writing up that contract. So I really understand what their expectations are and what they hope to get out of supervision. It's also important to monitor your supervisees and their professional development. And really it talks about personal development, but I would say it's really their professional development um, to see how they are growing as clinicians. And then modeling effective problem solving skills. We're always going to encounter problems and challenges in our clinical work, um, but modeling effectively how we can problem solve and work through those challenges is important. Other things that we need to do as supervisors. So promoting ethical knowledge and behavior, promoting knowledge and skills that are needed to work effectively with clients. Um, so individual clients and also clients from cultural backgrounds that differ from our own. Educating our supervisees about ethical issues that can occur when working in a managed care system. So if we're working within insurance billing in the United States. So how does informed consent work? What does confidentiality look like? What is a utilization review? These are things that would happen if someone is working within insurance billing in our country. And what does it mean to be competent? Also, and we talked a little bit about this, stressing the importance of self-care and assisting supervisees in developing strategies that can be effective for themselves. We know we have a really high rate of burnout in our field, and it's important that we take care of ourselves. And then how can we use supervision effectively? So modeling how these sessions might be structured, um, if we kind of get off task, bringing things back to task, um, and just modeling how we can do that effectively. Okay, so those are a lot of things, a lot of different roles and responsibilities that a supervisor may be expected to have. So as you think of this laundry list of things that you may be expected to do as a supervisor, is there anything you think might be helpful to make becoming or being a supervisor more manageable? So just um, Okay, so I'm so sorry. I was waiting for a break just so I could ask a quick question. Of course. Um, I, I, will, I will also touch base on this if you want me to, but- um, Sure. So the reason I, I was waiting is because I've been dying. So this whole week, I just, I needed to speak to someone who would have the answer to this question. <laughs> I so, hope I do. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I do too. So it touches base on all of the things that are expected from supervisees, supervisors. It tells about the different styles of supervision, I, you know, mm -hmm. all of those things. But it doesn't say to me what what would I do or, or what would happen if I was in a situation where my supervisor was... Uh, I, I don't even know what word to use, I guess, unethical, um, yes. uh, not supervising properly, like all of those things, like what would yeah. be my move in that moment? Because it, all I can think of is like, 
you know, of course, there's going to be people who just don't like their, you know, they don't, they don't like authority or they don't want to be supervised. So it's hard sure. to discern between those unless there's a place that you can go to if this happens, right? Mm -hmm. So well, let's say I, I start working for, or I'm being supervised by someone who, who doesn't practice ethically to begin with. Um, and then on top of that, they're not upholding the, their duties as supervisor for me. What would I do? Where, what would my next Absolutely. Yeah, so I think that's a really important question, Melissa. So the answer is going to differ a little bit based on where you're working or where you're in training. Let's say you're in a graduate program, for example. So there should be a procedure in place. Um, within every program, there's something called an ombudsman. So someone who wouldn't be evaluating you as a graduate student, but you could go to if there were questions or concerns that you had. So that is an option, or there's also someone who's probably like the program director or the director of clinical training. I think that's probably your first route. If okay. it's something where you feel comfortable talking to your supervisor, that's always a good first step, but it may not be. You know, if you're concerned that they're acting unethically, for instance, right. you may not feel comfortable going to them and that's completely reasonable. If you're working in an organization, hopefully, um, there are procedures in place. So similarly, I think sometimes you're going to have to go to that person's boss just to express your concerns or ask your questions. Um, I think those are, you know, really a good place to start, but you're right that it's going to differ a little bit depending upon where you, what location you're Yeah, I started, I started getting really concerned when I read like the third case or the third, uh, uh, <laughs> supervision style yes. I was like oh no I'm not okay with that I need to know that I'm doing the right thing and if you're not yeah. paying attention to me how yeah. am I supposed to go and I oh, think you're terrible. you're right that you're going to encounter supervisors that have really different styles over time and some are going to work better for you than others and I think all of us probably will create our own supervision style that's a little bit eclectic where we take in kind of pieces of the things that worked for us and the things that didn't work for us in terms of supervision right. too Thank you so much for answering yeah, that course. for me. Other, other questions that came up while you are reading, I knew there were a couple. I had seen Melissa's in her um, graphic organizer. Not too many questions. It seemed like most of this chapter was clear to people, but if anyone has questions, we can talk about those too. But what do you think? Any thoughts about if we have all these different responsibilities, how could we make our job easier for ourselves? Any ideas about that? Anything you think you could do to, to make supervision a little more manageable? Yeah, Eleanor. Uh, are you asking as the supervisee or the supervisor? It could be either. Yeah, you could take either perspective. Um, I guess as for like the supervisee, I feel like it would be easier for me. Like, okay, I'm, I'm not going to have 24 hour uh, contact with my supervisor. So if any questions that I could probably like keep a notebook on, I have one in my purse yeah. anyway. So if I have a question, I can write down what my question might be, mm -hmm. you know, maybe send out an email once a week or during the weekly, um, reviews, ask the questions that I have. And as a supervisor, I mean, I would always want to make sure that I'm providing my supervisee with all the correct information. Um, so maybe like if there's some things that I realize I'm struggling to remember that I think are important, also write them down and make sure that like, I don't, know, I don't know if I covered this, but I just want to make sure you know X, Y, and Z. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really important. And right, maybe you meet once a week, probably at most. Um, so knowing that maybe your supervisor is available via email, if you think of something in between or something like that, that that can be a good option. Yeah. So thank you. And that's good from both perspectives. So writing things down can be important. Help keeping yourself organized. Yeah. Chelsea. I was thinking along those same lines, like staying organized, but also I'm a huge um, calendar, like electronic setting reminders for myself is big. So maybe just like having a time during a specific day or whatever that you know that you'll have a pause to look at your phone or to, you know, act on whatever reminders that you're getting maybe you know once a week or however often like oh this happened with this client i need to check back with them in three days you know yep. set a reminder for three days from now check back with them on how their client's doing or 
whatever, but I think it definitely boils down to organization. <laughs> yes, I agree. Anytime you're managing a lot or have a lot on your plate, being organized can certainly help. Yeah. So those of you that use those, maybe electronic reminders, that can be a good option too. Yeah. Thank you. Jen. Um, I think you had mentioned, I thought it was a great idea for supervisees to have expectations written down what they expect to gain from their supervisor. And I think just having those clear, even the supervisor having clear expectations for their supervisee yes, is helpful, definitely. just being clear. Yeah, I think having those clear expectations and then hopefully having those really open lines of communication that you all described last week that if something isn't clear or anyone has questions that they feel comfortable bringing those up. Yeah, but that's a really good point. Um, so that hopefully the supervisee does have some understanding of how that relationship is going to work. Um, and some of that takes time to get to know someone just like any other relationship um, and maybe to feel comfortable with their style of supervision. And that's, that's okay. Um, any other thoughts that you all have about making supervision more manageable? And that's okay if you don't right now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you all, um, these are fairly brief, maybe like five or six minutes. And these are sort of snippets of supervision. This is supervision that is um, fictional. You know, they're kind of doing mock supervision here. Um, but it's good, I think, to kind of see supervision in action so that we can kind of start talking through some of the things that we think maybe went well in these supervision sessions and any other suggestions that you might have um, that this supervisor could have could have tried out. Um, these do have captions, but they're automatically generated. So I know that those are not always the best, um, but hopefully better than, than nothing. So let me pull this up for us real quick. I'll get our first one going. Uh, you don't wanna see email, let's see. Can you all see what looks like a video now? Okay, just making sure it actually popped up. Okay. Um, just move a couple of things on my screen. All right, this one's a little bit longer, about nine minutes. So this is a scenario where the supervisee is having some confidence, confidence issues with cognitive behavioral therapy techniques. And they kind of talk through some of this in supervision. Hello, my name is Dr. Grande. I want to welcome to this video on a challenging supervision scenario. I'd like to remind you that the person you'll see uh, in this video playing the role of the supervisee is acting, and this is a completely fictitious situation that we're acting out. And also, this video is completely for educational purposes. I want to offer special thanks to uh, two of my graduate assistants, Andrew and Nell for their diligence and hard work in producing this video. I hope it's helpful to you, and thank you. So, Anne, how have you been? I've been doing pretty well, thanks. Glad to hear it. Yeah. Tell me how things have been going in your sessions. Uh, well, for the most part, pretty well. Mm -hmm. But, um, well, I guess I'm feeling a little bit, um, how can I put it? Um, well, I'm not completely confident okay. in, well, for example, um, with CBT. Mm -hmm. All right, at school, we had this amazing class on CBT, and I did really well in my, um, my little um, vignette that I had to do. Okay. And so I thought, great this is a real strength of mine you felt pretty good about your your cognitive behavioral skills yeah mm -hmm. exactly um until i sat in on a couple of sessions with bill bill's pretty good at cbt oh my gosh no that's an understatement yeah. he how does he do that he's well i mean you gotta remember that's his primary modality he spends about 80 percent of his time actually practicing CBT. I think he's been to some special trainings as well. 
Um, it's been in the field a long time. That, that's always been kind of Bill's thing, CBT. Okay. Well, I, was, I guess I kind of thought it was going to be my thing, and then I saw him, and I was like, oh, my God. And you felt yeah. inadequate uh, next to him, huh? It, completely. Yeah. Completely. As a matter of fact, I was trying it in a session the other day, and, um, oh, my God, it was it was kind of like a mess. Um well, okay, that's that's too strong, but it it didn't work the way I expected it to work. Um, what what uh, what area were you struggling with? Well, okay, I started it when I saw my clients um, like at that change. The hot cognition. The hot cognition, exactly. And so I asked her, you know, I kind of stopped it, and I was like, well, what? What was going on just now? What were you thinking? What was going through your mind just now? Exactly. Um, and so, <clears throat> let's see. She told me, and I got to an automatic thought mm -hmm. pretty good. quickly. Very good. Um, and then I was trying to go deeper with the automatic thought, but it was like she wasn't cooperating. <laughs> I mean, it sounds bad to say it that way, but she kind of went off on a tangent and I sort of went with her. And then I was like, am I forcing it? If I try to take it back? And... Okay. I think I see, I think I see what you're talking about. So you had, you had to automatic thought. You, you felt right. pretty, you felt like you did a pretty good job at identifying that. Yeah. And, and I then, you, pretty and then you kind of maybe derailed a little on your tracking and, and yeah. skills to apply. Exactly. Exactly. Um, well, first let me say, um, don't compare yourself to Bill yet, okay? okay. He's been, he's been um, uh, practicing CBT a while, as I mentioned, okay? Okay. So don't let that discourage you. If anything, I think he's a good learning resource for you. Okay. Well, that's a good way to look at it. Um, I like that. So let me give you an example of what you can do next time you come to um, that automatic thought moment, meaning when you have a client who has uh, successfully identified an automatic thought. Okay. So uh, tell me about a time in, uh, when you were in session where you had an automatic thought of your own and, and try to make it a negative automatic thought because we also have, of course, positive automatic thoughts, okay. Okay, which, are, which are healthy and help us. But point out one to me that you feel is uh, not useful. Um, well, maybe in that same session mm -hmm. that I was just talking about. Sure. Um, yeah, I was definitely thinking... Um, I'm having a really hard time with this. Like, basically, like, I'm struggling here. Okay. So your automatic thought is, I'm struggling in this session right now with this client. It, exactly. Okay. So if that were true, what would that mean to you? What does that thought mean to you? I'm struggling right now with this client. It would mean... <laughs> it would mean... Maybe I'm not as good as I thought, or maybe even um, maybe this isn't the profession for me. So, so you're thinking, so that that thought were true, you're thinking maybe counseling is the profession for you. Yeah. Okay. It's really hard to say that to you. And I understand. I appreciate your courage in working through this. Okay. Um, and a counseling profession may not be for me. So what would it mean to you if that statement were true? Um, if the counseling profession were not the profession for me, oh my gosh, I've just invested how many years, how much time. Um, that would mean I'm a failure, or that would mean... I'm a failure. Because is that what I just said? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does that sound familiar? That that sentence on <laughs> failure? Oh yeah. Have we heard that before? <laughs> oh my god. It's one of the core beliefs. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Right? That's what I meant. Yeah, that's one of the four beliefs. That's one of the four beliefs. Wow, okay. So now the, the technique I just used to help you get from that automatic thought is called the downward arrow technique. Okay, and what you're really doing is you're asking the client, what does that thought mean to them? Or sometimes it, I, I find it helpful to say, what does it mean if that thought's true? Right. 
depending on kind of what they're telling me. Yeah. Uh, and that'll usually oftentimes lead you uh, from the automatic thoughts and intermittent belief, which it did for you. Okay. Uh, which is uh, intermediate belief was something like, uh, I'm not sure the counseling profession is for me. I'm not sure I'll be good at this, right? Okay. And then it moved you when you, when you thought, well, that's true. Mm-hmm. Like, if I'm not cut out to be in the counseling profession, it leads right to um, failure. It's a core belief. Okay. All right, so that's a technique you can try next time with a client, um, like the one you described uh, before, where you kind of derail a little bit once you got to the automatic thought level. Yeah. So try the downward error technique. I think that'll help you a lot. Okay. Um, I realized in your CBT course you probably had some uh, books. I'm also going to recommend uh, some text. Uh, we'll see if they overlap with the ones you had, but I, I have quite a few. Uh, probably not as many as Bill, all right, but I have a few. So um, I'm going to loan those to you. I want you to, uh, when you have the time, kind of read through some of the, especially some of the techniques, since that's what we're talking about right now. Okay. Uh, so there's some techniques you can use to um, identify automatic thoughts and to explore intermediate beliefs and the challenge core beliefs. All right, so a few different levels. Okay. And I also have a few articles, and of course, uh, I have my YouTube channel where I have some videos on there about cognitive behavioral therapy. Oh, great. All right, so you might have already seen other videos on there. Uh, for other areas, but I have a uh, playlist specifically for CBT. It talks about theory, and there's actually some role plays there, too. Oh, great. So yeah. between all those resources, I'm hoping that um, those will be valuable to you, and here in supervision, we'll continue to work on these techniques. Right. So that's how you plan? Definitely. Great. All right. Thanks, Ann. Thank you. Thank you for watching this video on a challenging counseling supervision case scenario. I would like to thank Andrew and Al again for their superb work. Okay. He's just going to thank them for helping with the filming at the end there, so we don't need to watch that part. But I'm just interested in your thoughts um after you watch this is there anything that you feel like went well in supervision and then on the flip side we can talk about anything you think might have helped improve that supervision session um um i think that the way that he showed her the cbt technique by like pulling her right into it so she's the client basically uh i loved that I, I thought that was amazing i wish i hope i have a supervisor who does that to me to help me really understand it it's where it's not just words or it's not just like this this idea in my head or you know like a list of things that i'm supposed to do in a row it's it, I, you've got to see it hands-on or brains on i'm not sure how you say that absolutely <laughs> Yeah, well, you're right, because if he had just said, hi, here's these books, here's this YouTube channel, that would have been looked a lot different, right, than actually, and he had the perfect opportunity. When we think about CBT, it's kind of getting at some of those negative thoughts that we have and those core beliefs, and she probably was experiencing that in session as well. So I agree. I think that was a technique he used really wisely where he could sort of apply that with her um, and, and try that out. Yeah. Other thoughts that you all have? Chelsea. Uh, aside from the whole situation, it made me extremely nervous for <laughs> our role playing situation. I could feel her anxiety through the screen. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. Well, and I think that's why I hope it'll be helpful. We'll have some opportunities to try out some role plays in class two, but please know that no one is going to be judged for their acting abilities or anything like that. Um, we'll all give it our best shot, but that's part of the reason I have you all try it out because it's a lot harder than it looks um, and much more comfortable to try it out when it's not for real in some sense, right? Give us an opportunity to practice, yeah. Uh, but again, no one's gonna be judged on their acting abilities. You'll be able to kind of prepare sort of a script in advance that you can refer back to also. So it won't have to all be off the cuff. And if we're like, sorry, focusing no. on that for a second, like, this sounds like a dumb word, but like if you break character, like you're not getting judged on like, no, it's okay. <laughs> you get halfway through and then you're like, oh my God, I can't remember what I was going to do or say. No, or it's okay. Yes. Pause and regroup for a minute. 
That's okay. totally fine. Yes. Yeah. Other thoughts that anyone had? Anything, Eleanor, something else you thought went well? Um, I just wrote down some things that I noticed. Uh, he was an active listener. He brings up the special classes and training that Bill had done. Mm -hmm. um, to me, that was kind of like encouraging her and also mm -hmm. providing her with like suggestions. Um, she, he encouraged her by saying, like, don't let that concern you. Um, verified what she was saying so that he could better understand what she was trying to explain to him to make sure that he could be answering the correct questions. Um, he gave suggestions and used examples. Uh, it sounded very similar to a therapy session to me. That um, one did. I agree. Yes. Yeah. And it won't always be like that. Yeah. I kind of felt like, I was like, am I supposed to be noticing this? Because it's kind of like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. But then when, at, after he used her situation as an example, because that's when it started feeling like it was going into a therapy session. I agree. And so then I was like, but at the end, when he was like, okay, do you see what happened there? Then it was like, oh, okay. It well, made more sense. Yeah. Far away from a therapy session. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he recommended some books for her to read. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any Anything else that you all appreciated about the supervision session? Anything else you want to mention? Okay, so let's think about the flip side for a minute here. And it's always easy, probably easier for us as we watch these that we can find things wrong, maybe your things we do differently. But any suggestions that maybe you'd have for the supervisor or things that you would have liked to have seen gone differently in the supervision session? Um, I guess um I maybe let her sit in on some of his, you know, or maybe ha just so he can show her, you know, because I, yeah. I really think it helped her to understand and grasp the concept of what she was doing with the client when he did it to her. So I think it would be helpful for her to maybe sit in and watch him use CBT, um, whereas she wouldn't be looking at someone who is so, not that that's a bad thing. It's good to yeah. learn from the best, right? But yeah. at the same time, where she's just coming into it and kind of trying to gain, gain some confidence and, and know that she's doing the right thing, it, I think it would have been helpful for him to offer to do it for her. Yeah, no, that's a good point. So offering an opportunity maybe to observe some sessions, either his or someone else's. Yeah, I think that's a good suggestion. Anything else that you all thought up? Good, you're not judgmental. You're like, it was great. He did a good job, but he did offer her some opportunities to learn from, right? Okay, so let's do, let's go through and let's do one more scenario for today. So let me pull that one up. Oh, hold on, it's not liking what I'm trying to do. Give me a second. Okay, let's try again. <clears throat> we are gonna have the same supervisor here. Hello, my name is Dr. Grande. I wanna welcome to this video on a challenging supervision scenario. I'd like to remind you that the person you'll see uh, in this video playing the role of the supervisee is acting, and this is a completely fictitious situation that we're acting out. And also this video is completely for educational purposes. I want to offer special thanks to uh, two of my graduate assistants, Andrew and Nell, for their diligence and hard work in producing this video. I hope it's helpful to you, and thank you. Hi, how you been? I'm okay. Good. I'm okay. 
How, how have you been with, uh, I know there was some stress over uh, Robert, some excitement yesterday. Yeah. Uh, and he's, I want you to know, give me an update that uh, he's hospitalized, that he was taken to the hospital. Okay. And he's, and he's safe. Okay. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. All right. Oh, I feel, I feel really glad to hear that. Yeah. How are you coping with all that? No, I, I, I mean, it feels like, I feel like I should be more professional or something, but I've been pretty freaked out about it was a scary experience, sure. What What do you think in particular is bothering you about? Well, I guess I mean it's pretty obvious. Like, you know, Meredith lost a client just a couple months ago. Time. Yeah. Was it a couple of months? I mean, it seems it seems more recent than that to me. And that was tragic. You know, I I guess I felt it was sad when I heard about it, mm -hmm. you know, but then yesterday when everything went down with Robert, I mean, it got real. Yeah, that was definitely a scary experience. Um, I remember you coming into my office in uh, quite a hurry there and let me know about it, which was the right thing to do um, when he expressed those suicidal ideations and they had the whole uh, plan worked out. Yeah, yeah and I mean, it, it was like, I guess it was the first time it really hit me that, I guess, how can I put it? I mean, I could lose a client. Yeah, counseling is a serious business. So it's the first time you've understood um, in a kind of direct, in-your-face way that um, the consequences of our actions potentially could be very harmful to clients. That's exactly it. Mm -hmm. That's exactly it. Yeah, and it just, I guess it just feels really kind of heavy. It feels like so much responsibility. And, um, I mean, Meredith's been doing this a long time. Mm -hmm. If it could happen to somebody that experienced. And I'm brand new. Mm -hmm. You know, and it just really, I guess it, it made me feel afraid. You know, do I have what it takes? So it's shaking your confidence a little bit. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, you might remember at the um, onset of your internship here that I told you you would be assessing clients for uh, suicidality, right, um, uh, and, and evaluating that, and it happens frequently in this type of setting. Uh, I'm uh, a little surprised. It's not completely typical for your first time to have somebody express an ideation, they also have intent and plan end up in the hospital. So I want to let you know that's not an everyday thing. Oh, okay. God. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That's not every day, right? All right. Um, that's what we do in extreme circumstances when we're genuinely concerned or, you know, we can't control the risk. Okay. Okay. All right. And I felt after evaluating yesterday that, that our facility wasn't capable of controlling that risk. I didn't feel safe sending them home. Okay. okay. How, how will I know? Well, I mean... We can go through some, and I know you've already covered this in your, in your uh, classes. Right. We can go through some additional techniques uh, in terms of assessing suicidal um, ideation, okay. intent, or plan. Oftentimes, and we can't be dismissive of anybody who expresses ideation, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, but oftentimes, uh, you know, a lot of it's passive ideation. It's like they're not suicidal, they just don't want to wake up the next day. Okay? And those aren't exactly the same things. Like suicidal to me, uh, implies a higher threat level, right? Where not wanting to live is like hopelessness. You know, not wanting to wake up, rather, is hopelessness. It's more passive. It's more passive, right? Yeah. Uh, still, again, it has to be taken seriously, and, and we'll go through some different protocols you can follow. Okay. One thing I really want you to continue doing um, is coming to me whenever you have somebody who has uh, ideation. Okay. Okay. Uh, and there might become a point where... Uh, I let you go further into that without coming back to me, right? Okay. Right now, as soon as there's suicide ideation, I want you to come to me. Okay. And then I'll meet with the client, and I'll show you how I assess. And then over time, you'll start to do that for yourself. Are you concerned about my abilities, too? I'm not, but I want you to have a um, structured and consistent learning experience that's progressive from the beginning skills all the way through the advanced assessment. Okay. I'm actually highly confident in your abilities, uh, and 
I, I feel that, well, partially that's indicated because you came to me right away, like you knew that that was outside your level of competency right now. Okay. And so you recognize that. That recognition is crucial. Okay? Okay. That, that's what's important. So continue to work on recognizing that. Okay. Continue to come to me. I'll help you through those assessments. And I would guess by the time you've done internship, uh, you'll have assessed many people independently. Okay. Well, let's, let's get there the right way, like one step at a time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Okay. Definitely. And it actually, it makes me feel a lot better about myself, too. I also have some uh, reading material on suicide assessment okay. that uh, I can give you. I have this, uh, this little book that has a uh, assessment that you actually write on, like after you've done your progress note. If somebody mentions any type of suicide ideation and tangible plan, okay. you can evaluate them for certain risks. Oh, okay. So it's just another level of protection and assessment uh, for the client and you. Okay, so I'll give that to you. And also before uh, Robert gets out of the hospital, mm -hmm. right, we'll work on a plan on how to reintegrate him into getting services here because we know that he has the potential, right, as anybody does, to, to have suicidal thoughts and have to plan. So I want to work on you in advance of that so that you're ready to go when he comes back. Good. Yeah. Okay. That's not a good plan that would work? Definitely. Definitely. Um, very good. And uh, thanks for bringing this issue to me. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for being so open and helping me. So Absolutely. Much. Thanks, Sean. Okay. So same clinician that we have here, um, but a different scenario. So in this scenario, um, she had a client presenting with suicidal ideation and ultimately some intent and a plan. So any thoughts about um, her supervisor's response to this situation in their supervision session? I think that he did really well, really well. And I kept watching their body language. I don't know if she's doing it for the sake of acting or <laughs> if it's like genuinely, she could not stop picking at her yeah. hands are going a mile a minute. I'm like, yeah. put them down. Yeah. I can't focus right now. But in watching her, then I started looking at him and he mm -hmm. sits very confidently and he stays calm with her the whole time and, you know, has his hands on his leg that are kind of like, he's open to her, but also just, he was very professional, I think, throughout all of it. I like that he instilled a lot of confidence in her and then reassured her when she was taught, like, oh, wait, does that mean you're not confident in my skills? That he was right. like, no, we're yeah. just going to progress from here. And I like that he addressed before they ended um, about the client returning. Like, I think Absolutely. that that probably for me would be like, I would almost feel like, did I not do it right? Am I like, am I off this case kind mm -hmm. of thing? Like yeah. I couldn't handle this. So I probably can't work with him again or whatever. So for him to like reassure her that like, they're gonna come up with a plan. I thought that that was really mindful. Absolutely. And I think, um... You know, just it sounds like this was supposed to be pretty early on in her training. So, yes, you know, you've had classes on how to do a, you know, a suicide assessment, but it doesn't mean we wouldn't want for you always to have your first client then, you know, be actively suicidal and have to be hospitalized. So it sounds like he also stepped in and met with the client after they did. It just doesn't sound like she was present for that. So maybe an opportunity, right, which he said he'd provide where she could observe um, some of that suicide assessment as well. Um, but Chelsea, I think as a bit of an aside, you bring up a good point too, where you kind of notice when people are on film, right? So her mannerisms, and those are good opportunities throughout your training. I think also, if you decide to go on and, you know, go to graduate school and become a clinician, you'll have opportunities to, you'll record real sessions, but also probably some mock sessions. And you'll realize so much about your nonverbal behavior too. Um, so how you're sitting, what your hands look like, things that we're not always even aware of or mannerisms that we always use or what our filler words are and all of those types of things. So 
again, kind of stressful when you first do it, but really good to kind of make ourselves, you know, mindful and aware of those things too. Um, other thoughts about this particular supervision session? Any recommendations for the supervisor here? Anything that you think he could have done differently? This is kind of a minor thing, but one thing I thought is, you know, she almost sort of had to ask for that validation that she was doing okay. So maybe kind of starting out with, you know, yes, this is what happened but reassuring her if if he really felt that way and that was appropriate, which he said he was confident in her skills. So um, just something to kind of maybe think about is sometimes offering that unsolicited feedback because I think we all need it. And maybe in a situation where she was feeling really concerned um, or that she hadn't done a good job, um, that would be particularly important. Um, but otherwise, you know, I really wanted you all to have these as opportunities and we'll continue. I'll show some other examples too, um, but just as um, an opportunity to kind of start to dive in and see some supervision in action. And we will have opportunities to kind of practice in class too. So don't worry, I won't throw you all to the wolves um, at the end of the semester without having a chance to practice too. So we'll at least take part of next week's class. Um, I'll make sure we can, at the beginning of class, kind of pair up and I'll give you some time to start just kind of brainstorming. We'll continue to cover other things throughout the semester, but it'd just be good to kind of start thinking about the assignment. Um, and you can obviously revise that and work on it more later in the semester too. Um, okay, I was gonna show you one more, but let's just, we'll wrap up a little early today. Instead, we'll save that um, session for another time. Um, so if anyone has, any other questions about anything? I'm happy to stay on and answer those. Otherwise, I hope that you have a great weekend and I'll see you all next week. Awesome. Bye everyone. Have a good week. Bye. Take care.